your first-hand accounts. We are here to test, and I'm telling them that I was talking to them. A lot of people who know me, I'm still the first person they know. But it was almost like you were patient zero for South Seattle. Your stories of community coming together. I um, partnered very heavily with Tacoma Urban League, who is doing some but amazing, amazing work in response. We're doing things for small businesses. We're giving out uh, loans for small businesses. We're, we're... And so I think it's very important that we have leaders who feel the I mean, I, I can tell you we're calling 20, 30, 40 members. With this crisis in our community, we've been, able, we've been working mm -hmm. to address it. Uh, Rainier yeah. Avenue Radio, broadcasting 24 hours a day, Seven days a DJ Dirty John. Karen Z with Rainier Avenue Radio. Hey, this is Sergio Cool. Rainier Avenue Radio. World. 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 Rainier Avenue Radio. World. We got you covered. Local impact. Global press. We broadcast. Welcome to Rainier Avenue Radio. World and our weekly coverage of the impact of the community. Continuation of our series. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us again here. And then again, now we are aware of the fact that. You are listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Don't forget to log on www.rainieravenueradio.world. Yo, what up, though? I got to talk. I got to tell what I feel. I got to talk about my life as I see it. All right, then. It's time for you to bring it to the table. Turn up your radio wherever uh -huh. you at. We about to bring it. Street B. Yeah. With Tony B. For the next hour, Tony B will give you a chance to tackle local, national, and international issues that affect your community. Street B. Street B. Welcome to this evening's edition of Street Beat. It's me, your host, Tony B, and the beat of the city. Um, well, this evening uh, in particular, um, that is going to be the Black Futures Fund Co-op. If you haven't heard of it, uh, get ready. Black Future uh, Co-op's fund purpose is to acknowledge the harm of systemic racism and to serve as a hub to address the impact that systemic racism has had on the black community. Uh, I think that I just still have one with me now. Just one. Uh, Andrea. Uh, and I believe that would be you. And I want to make sure that I say your last name correctly here. Is it Copain? It's Copain. Thank you. Copain. Yes. Copain. And I, I think that we're going to be joined um, probably here pretty quickly. Uh, hopefully, uh, by Twina Nobles and Angela Jones. Um, but you know what, Andrea? We'll get, we'll get started with you. Why not? <laughs> we can't have just one thing stop the show, right? <laughs> uh, so again, I want to... Um, uh, the Black Future Co-op Fund. Uh, and four women are, are the architect of this. Uh, Angela Jones, as I mentioned before, and, uh, we'll be hearing, uh, hopefully, from Angela. Uh, she's the chief executive officer of Washington STEM. And then also uh, Twina Nobles uh, should be joining us and the president and CEO of the Tacoma Urban, Tacoma Urban League. Michelle Merriweather is the CEO, executive director of uh, the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. And uh, uh, here joining us uh, at Bird Bar, uh, and I guess you are the executive director at Bird Bar. Uh, prior to that, uh, worked for the Washington State Governor's Commission on African American Affairs. Uh, Andrea Capane. Andrea, welcome to Street Beat. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. And I'd like to also uh, give give some runway to my my dear colleague Angela Jones, who's just joined us. Hi okay. there. Thank you for having us today. Hi, right, Angela. To with you. Good to, good to have you here, Angela. Um, so yeah, I. Uh, I was about to get started talking um, uh, with Andrea. Uh, Angela, you're here as well. Uh, I talked a little bit uh, again uh, uh, about what we're here for, uh, about what this is all about, the Black Future Co-op Fund. And so just saying that, if people aren't familiar with it, they might wonder, what is this? What What is this about? Um, already, uh, you've secured... 
two and a half million dollars uh, for this fund, which is a big deal. The goal is to raise twenty-five million, and I spoke briefly uh, about what this fund uh, was going to be used for. We'll talk that, uh, more about that in depth. But one of you tackle this first question. Um, how did this come about? The Black Future Co-op Fund, uh, and I, the information that I have says that it, it, it again, uh, the George Floyd murder, when a lot of things began to happen, uh, people took to the streets. Um, how did this come about? The Black, how did this come about? That's open to either one. of I'll pick one if you want me to. Angela? No, I can jump in there. I can jump in there. Okay. Um, we, we, we speak with one voice, Angela and I and Tawana and Michelle. Okay. And really, Tony, I feel like we haven't been giving this work enough credit that even though it may seem like this magical thing happened out of nowhere mm -hmm. because of this new recognition for equity, especially for Black communities, We've always been doing this work in the background. Mm -hmm. And it was easiest for us to daylight this work at this most appropriate time, right? Since the killing of George Floyd, there's this harnessing of these impulses to take action, to make something happen, to create a better future on behalf of Black Washingtonians. And us four women have always been talking about how do we organize ourselves to ensure greater resources to our communities. So it was always a conversation that we've been having in our separate circles and together. And it was really about watching all of the activism happening, the protests, the storming of City Hall, the storming of police department steps. And we thought to ourselves, we need to complement what's going on on the ground. Yeah. We need to be storming the steps in proximity to where we sit, these boardrooms and these halls of power. And it quickly became interesting when we talked about, well, philanthropy is in our proximity. Why don't we storm those steps and make our demands? Mm -hmm. And we thought we will get an audience with our philanthropic partners who we're working with every day anyway. We saw the will that they exhibited to raise funds in response to COVID back in March, right? Raising $22 million in a 48 hour period in response to COVID. And so then we challenged them to raise 25 million on behalf of the black community. And they said, yes. And it took off from there, Tony. Uh, again, I, I just think that that's outstanding. Um, and I wanted to delve a little bit more into each of your individual backgrounds as well. And I thought that that would uh, kind of paint a, paint, paint a fuller picture. But, but that's how it happened. You four, uh, again, I know that there was a history before this, decided that you wanted to do this. You wanted to make something happen. And just like people who were maybe taking to the streets or leading protests, um, you got together and in a very short amount of time um, brought your vision to reality that that that's what it seems again i know that there was things leading up to this and we'll talk about that uh but i think that that's just another phenomenal example of leadership um in our community uh some of the things as you mentioned were very upfront at the time because of of the various rallies and marches that were in place it also uh provided opportunity for leadership uh, but I think this, again, is a, is a wonderful example, and I'm excited to talk to you more uh, about this. And, and you know, all, all these questions are not going to be softballs because we're talking about money and we're talking about uh, leadership and we're talking about where money goes. But just to start this off, uh, I, I give uh, major props and major credit to you for um, uh, for the lane. So I, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about each of you individually. Uh, and, Angela, um, let's... Uh, Let's, let's start with you again. I mentioned Chief Executive Officer of Washington STEM, uh, experienced leader in systemic change. Um, tell us a little bit more uh, about your background. And, sure. and, and, and again, um, what got you to where you are now? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to start with my dad mm -hmm. and giving, giving props to him um, for, from as young as I can remember, my father said, my, my dad grew up in Arkansas, segregated South, and said, every generation must do better than the one that came before them. And that's your responsibility. I just, I, I, the earliest memory I have is five years old and trying to figure out over all these years what that means um, and what, what steps I take to make sure that I am, I am carrying that torch that he handed off to me. Uh, we know the history 
of slavery in our family. And so when I think and I get tired and go, wow, this is tough. Do we really want to take this on? Um, I'm reminded that what we're dealing with now is nothing compared to what our ancestors dealt with. And so I'm always like, I have all of them walking behind me and I'm standing on those shoulders. So that's what's propelled me to get to the point where I can sit at a table and, and be a CEO um, of, of an organization. And, you know, as, as Andrea mentioned, sit in boardrooms and sit um, with some you know, corporate giants, um, you know, really important. But, you know, then, you know, in these moments, and, and these aren't the only moments, this is, this is a historic moment, but we've had so many moments um, over the last, you know, several centuries, right? Mm-hmm. And being able to come to this point, though, um, and say, in this moment, we have a chance um, to really leverage how people are feeling. You saw all of these statements come out from all of these companies. And it's like, okay, that that's a beautiful statement. But how are you going to operationalize it? Well, let us help you. Mm-hmm. Boy, do we have an opportunity for you to make sure your statements are not performative. And as Andrew already mentioned, leveraging those relationships. So, I mean, that's been how I was raised um, throughout. My father was in the in the military. He worked his way up, became a public affairs officer. So people wonder, you know, wonder about my gift of gab and gift of networking. You know, I learned from the best. I learned, you know, at his hip. Um, I became an educator um, as well, so that I could understand that system. And then I went to law school so I could understand that system. I went to law school in my 40s and was like, I need to learn this other system that. Um, really oppresses our people. Um, and so just had mentors along the way, but it started, you know, with my parents and people along the way who took chances on me and provided me with resources. And, you know, that's what we want this fund um, to be, quite frankly. And I've spent the last 30 years in Eastern Washington, but now I'm living here near Seattle. Um, so my my um, heart, still pieces of my heart are still in Eastern Washington. So when we say this is a statewide fund, we really mean that it's a statewide fund. It's not just for King County or Pierce County or Snohomish. It's for the for Black community across the entire state of Washington. The Black Future Co-op Fund, uh, among other things, probably, and we'll find out more as uh, we uh, get deeper into this conversation, investing in health, housing, education, Youth Development, Art and History, Economic and Land Development, and Advocacy and Civic Engagement. Uh, also, again, uh, we've talked a little bit uh, on the phone. Is, is Twina on, he- on here? Twina's not here yet. Twina's not here yet. Um, uh, I mentioned Bird Bar, uh, where you worked. Um, and, well, that's currently where you are now, Andrea. And uh, you are also, if I'm not mistaken, running for public office as well? Yes, I was. Okay. Was or are? Was. I suspended my campaign last week. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Okay. Um, and uh, also uh, formerly at the Washington State Governor's Commission on African American Affairs. And I thought Angela just did a, a great job of giving us the backstory into who she was. And so I can read the bio and everything. But Andrea, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and again, how you got to the position where you are at right now? Thank you for that. Uh, similar to Angela, I've also learned at the hips of those who came before me. And I was raised by my grandparents and especially my grandmother who all of her life gave her life in service to others. I saw when we didn't have nearly enough, her giving food out of our refrigerator, giving her time. I felt my grandmother was that quintessential public servant. So she taught me, she lit that fire in me to give back to those less fortunate, even at times when we didn't have it ourselves, but living your life in service to others. And so I went the path of policy. I started out in Olympia. I was a legislative aide for this very district, the 37th district. I worked for the Washington State Senate, the House of Representatives, before moving on to the governor's office. And it was really instilled in me from being raised in my family that you commit your life in service to others through your talents and your experience. And it was my love of history that led me to political science. And it was my love of service that led me to a master's in public administration that then led me to where I am today at Burbar Place, formerly Camp Central Area Motivation Program, which is that quintessential service social service agency that gives its life in service to others. 
And so it was a combination of my lived experiences as someone who needed to see a better future for myself and my people, but also learning alongside those who came before me, who gave their life in service, that has led me to where I am today, Tony. Awesome. Now, and Tawina is actually based out of Tacoma, and yeah. I'll, I'll let her uh, talk more uh, about that. So I, I want to get into some of the nuts and bolts of this. Um, the Black Future Co-op Fund. Um, let, let's start with, are there some initial things that you are, uh, as part of your strategy, uh, that you can share with us that you plan to do? Uh, this is this is this is great. It sounds like one of the things that needed to happen. A lot of the complaints when COVID did happen were that there was no direct pipeline to assist with the communities that were going to be hurting the most. And the black community was one of those communities uh, when it came to getting funding. Um, let, let's talk about the, the strategy. Just share with us. Uh, how you plan to kick this off, how, what you are planning to do to accomplish the goals uh, that you have. And now these are, I'm sure, big goals, but to get started, um, what can you share with us uh, about how you plan to take action? Well, one of the things that we find very important is we need to hear from our people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of folks who are like, what's next? You know, when are you going to give out your first grant? What's it going to be about? You know, those buckets you already listed earlier, Tony, that was just a place to start. Mm -hmm. And we really want to hear And So we're going to do focus groups across the state with black communities um, so that we can hear and say, are these the right buckets? Is this actually what you need support with support with? And the challenge is that the needs of King County may be different than Whatcom County, may be different than than uh, Tri-Cities, may be different from Spokane. And so we need to take time for the remainder of this year going around to different communities and saying, what, what do you really need? What are you already doing that's great in your community, but you might need some help making sure there's a strong infrastructure or what's something innovative that nobody has ever invested in this community to do that we might be able to make those, those investments through the Black Future Co-op Fund. And so our first thing is we recognize that it's not just, you know, Twan, Andrew and Michelle and Angela's show where we get to decide where everything goes or it's not going to work. We want to hear from our people because for centuries, our people have been told what to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And what we want is to say, OK, we, we've heard from the collective. You know, we're hoping in 2021 we can do some initial investments into our community. But we're asking for people to say, you know, what is important? What is it we need right now? you know, in this moment and then leading up to 2021, where we can start the investment. The other important thing is while we're doing that, we have to shore up the infrastructure of the fund itself. So 25 million is actually not even enough for what we need to get done in the state of Washington. It's a beginning. So we've been also continuing to build relationships as we try to hit that $25 million mark to say, thank you for your donation. And we'll be coming back because it needs to be a sustaining fund. It's not a one shot because we're all feeling some kind of way in the moment because of George, George Floyd's murder and the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, we felt some kind of way for 401 years. And so you know, that means our community has not had all of that time to develop and build a foundation. And so we wanna do it right and we wanna do it in a sustainable way. So first steps first, all that to say, we're, we're going out and we're talking to people first and saying, what does your community need? All right. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best here not to gush at my excitement about this because I just think this is this is awesome. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm a, but but I, I you know, there's some questions that need to be asked uh, just because I think this is an, another during this time. Uh, again, for those listening, this is another form of leadership that you weren't hearing about. Uh, and all of them are important. But I think as an example. Uh, to, in particular, uh, young black women out there who are graduating in 2020, who are uh, uh, faced with, again, this social upheaval and uh, are looking at uh, how they want to use academia, um, 
you, you this this is just a, this is just a shining example of that but now let me get back to the show um so uh, one of the things that happened and i'm not mad at you if it's just the four of you uh so you want to hear what people say you want to form uh, a lot of times what happens in these situations is you take input you you get people to be part of it you set up committees and then things get bogged down and action does not happen uh, so I can completely understand when you're saying you just don't want it to be y'all for and what you do. But at the same time, um, how are you going to take in all this information all over the state and then make decisions where you are really looking at taking input from a potentially wide swath of people? How do you see that realistically happening? We're going to go to where we have traditionally not gone. Right. We tend to go to our well-known institutions, our well-established institutions, for which Bird Bar Place is one of them. We're gonna go to where the groups were not highly noticed by philanthropy, that were overlooked when resources came to our state. And as Angela said, it was very specific when Angela said, and I come from Eastern Washington. It's really important that us four women, when we continue to talk about us being managing partners and the architect of this fund, that we also highlight we're not the deciders in how we fund and who we fund. We, in, we need to ensure that this is fairly distributed across the state. There are 261,000 Black Washingtonians. And as Angela said, yes, we're in Whatcom County and Spokane County and Yakima and King and Pierce. We're also in Port Angeles and Vancouver, right? And so we are going to go to those communities we're gonna be there in person and virtually, and it's not going to be perfect. So I'll acknowledge that we know this, mistakes will be made and we will repair them. But we're gonna to go to those unlikely places where groups have been disadvantaged, as you said, Tony, by processes that have bogged us down. So it's gonna be quick. It's gonna be a four month process, get in, get out. We're gonna start administering grants January of 2021, but we're not starting with the established institutions. We're going to start with the activists on the streets and work on a bottoms up approach. The, the, the one thing, Tony, if I might add that is important is, I think there's still a way, I think we'll find themes as we talk to our people. Um, and I, but I think there's still a way to look at some of the investment regionally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it won't look the same in King County as it does you know, in, in Franklin and Benton counties. And so I think there's still a way to hear the voices, figure out the themes and help them meet their needs on a regional level. So it won't look identical across the entire state in terms of, of how we invest the fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you brought up something uh, again that I, uh, it's easy to get excited, you know, 2.5, it's a lot of money, but it ain't really a lot of money. Um, 25 million is a whole lot of money, but again, it ain't really a whole lot of money. Now, when I say that, it's a nice piece of change to have. Um, what what is how do you plan to make this? And if you could just take us through the process, maybe it's a three year plan, maybe it's a five year plan. I know you've given this some thought. How do you plan to make this sustainable so that again, as you begin the process of impacting and affecting the community, the pot of money goes down. Uh, is this something that is only supposed to happen for three years? You hit 25 million. Once the money's gone, it's gone. What is the plan in place to make this sustainable? Like Angela said, this is not a one and done. When we approached those initial funders about funding, we were very clear with them that when the media goes away, once the attention pivots to another issue, we expect them to continue to replenish this fund. 25 million, like you said, Tony, is not nearly enough. It just skims the surface of the 400 years of work that we need to do. And so we do expect that even after myself and Angela Tawana and Michelle are no longer involved, that this fund will continue well into the future. I have to coin Angela's term. We are working to be good ancestors. And we would be not be good ancestors if this is just a one and done $25 million pot of fund that disperses and then we go away pivot our attention to something else. This needs to be a truly a shifting of the table to allow for those voices that were not represented before, to allow for a specific focus on our Black communities for the long term. 
tactically, we're asking people to, to consider multi-year gifts so that we're not having to come back to the table every year. So it's an opportunity for them to give over three or, or five years, however they want to do it. So that's another strategy we're employing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so this this is something uh, that you're looking to have funded perpetually. Um, are there any other uh, potential streams of income that you're looking at right now to make this uh, sustainable? And uh, again, the Black Future Co-op Fund is what we're talking here. My guests joining me are Angela Jones and uh, Andrea Capane. Um, and this is something that's new. Um, uh, uh, again, uh, a, a response to uh, initially being uh, a, a group that was hit hardest uh, by the coronavirus. And a lot of folks in the community already knew that was going to happen. And then again, exacerbating the... Uh, was the race crisis that also came to light. And um, uh, during this time, if you were uh, from an organization that was black, then you knew uh, the place you were in the struggle to get funded. You were appealing to organizations that were run by white folks uh, that were making decisions. And I'm not slamming the process. I'm just saying it is what it is. And so to have something like this in place, at least to start taking a look at uh, how things can happen in a crisis or how some of the systemic changes that need to be made can be made ends up being incredibly important to the community. When this first happened, uh, one of the things that we realized was that, wait a minute, um, kids in our community don't have the Internet, and how are they going to learn from home? Uh, again, it was, uh, well, we knew this was going on for a long time, but there was uh, nothing to do. And then on top of that, a lot of kids needed to eat at school. And well, that was another thing. Well, how do we address this problem? So there was a lot of catching up to do. I say that to say uh, that as a group, do you have uh, what I would call maybe your top three uh, core values, initial things that you feel? And of course, this is subjective and this is your point of view. But, But what can you share with us where you would say these are critical things that need to be addressed immediately? Because for some folks, it might be child care. Uh, for some folks, it might be job skills. I mean, there are so many. It might be health-related issues. You have education on there. Can you identify for us uh, at this point in time if you have? And I'm just going to say top three, and it doesn't have to stay with that. But at least a few things uh, that you are going to say. These are some things that we already know that we have to address. We're still going to do our statewide research. I'm going to give you some time to think about that because we're going to take uh, a little break here for about three minutes minutes and come back and uh, get some answers to those questions. You're listening to Street Beat uh, with me, Tony B, on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Again, my guests are Angela Jones and Andrea Capane and two uh, of the architects of the Black Futures Fund Co-op. We'll be back right after this. Would you like to see when your favorite Rainer Avenue Radio show comes on? Check out our show schedule updated weekly at Rainer Avenue Radio dot world. Seattle King County Public Health is working to help keep you and your community safe from the threat of novel or new coronavirus. Take the following steps to help avoid the spread of all respiratory viruses. Wear a mask around others. Stay six feet apart. Limit your exposure and visits to others. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects or surfaces such as remote controls and doorknobs. Wash your hands often and use hand sanitizer and testing if you have symptoms or have been around someone who's tested positive for COVID-19. For more information, call 206-477-3977. That's 206-477-3977. This has been a message of Seattle King County Public Health. This is the news on Rainier Avenue Radio. Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves signed a bill Tuesday abandoning the state's flag and stripping the Confederate battle flag from flag symbol from it. According to the Washington Post, Mississippi will take down the only state flag that still bears such an emblem. The new flag's design will be determined later, but lawmakers have barred it from including the most recognizable icon of the Confederacy, which many people associate with racism, slavery, and oppression. On Monday, we talked about how this move gained momentum because of protests examining statutes 
statues of Confederate generals and broader discourse over racial inequality. When lawmakers voted to approve the move, it was reported that loud applause broke out inside the state capitol. In the bill, lawmakers laid out two requirements for the flag's eventual replacement. It cannot include Confederate symbol, and it must incorporate the phrase, in God we trust. State building must remove the flag within 15 days of the bill's signage. As of today, the flag at the state capitol building was taken down. And that's your news on Rainier Avenue Radio. Rainier Avenue Radio presents all music all day Saturday. Music all day Saturday. This is Edwin Bailey, Bulldog Blue. Jazz from the Cabinets. That's right. It's time once again for Jazz from the Cabinets with Big Poppy. Star Time. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Paul Pierce. This is Star Time. Saturdays, all music, all day. Reggae Hour, K Fox Night. You looking for the perfect beat? Yeah, it's the beat of the box. K-Fox Fresh Night. juice with D Money in the group. Myself, D Money. Nice size Patron. Taylor Hart. This is Spencia, the Northwest Rap Game. DJ Medina. Chad Cheddar. Come on. Northwest Rap Sergio LaCour's Love Line. It's Sergio's Love Lines with Sergio LaCour. Go into the phone line. Tell her who we talk. Sea Monster Radio. Mo Jams is your jam. We're live. Welcome to Mo Jam Mondays. This is KZ of KZ Music Media. Caller Goddess. Caller Goddess for Mo Jam Mondays. For- Just my opinion. God is inspiration. Music. All day and all night. Saturdays on Rainier Avenue Radio. This is Rainier Avenue Radio. Dot world. Welcome back to Street Beat. It's me, your host, Tony B. My guests joining me are Andrea Capain and uh, also Angela Jones, two of the architects of the Black Futures Co-op Fund. Uh, Twina did get in touch with us and let us know that there was a school board issue going on tonight, uh, so she won't be able to make it. And the other fourth member, uh, Michelle Merriweather, um, I already knew she wasn't going to be here, the CEO of the Urban League. We are talking to uh, Angela and Andrea. And the question that I asked uh, before we went to break was if you had, maybe you can give me the top three. There are obviously a number of areas uh, where clearly now we see what systemic uh, oppression has done. Um, but if you were to say for folks, look, these are these are some core areas where we think right away, um, unilaterally, uh, that we need to make sure that we have an impact. What would they be? So you touched on it uh, a little bit earlier about from whence we came, right? So I, I tell people, and this is not my original words, I heard this someplace else, that America's greatest strength is, is its ability to forget, right? Forget how this country was built on colonialism, land theft, slavery, and genocide. And as a result, it's impacted our black communities in the worst way where we're doing the worst on every pillar of well-being that you can think of, right? When you think of economic security, health, education, criminal justice, civic engagement, and our very first step is actually outlined in the name of the fund, Mm -hmm. which is the Black Future Co-op Fund. Mm That word co-op is very intentional because it means cooperation. We need to take our time and do our work to create alignment amongst our black communities. And this is why we, it was important for us when we outline the mechanics of this fund that it be for across Washington state. Because one of the first mechanisms of divisiveness across our state for black communities is that when resources do come to our communities, not nearly enough, but when they do, they do come into King County, the largest county, right? And granted, 49% of Black folks do live in King County, but it doesn't mean folks aren't suffering in Spokane and Whatcom. And so we want to recognize that we want to proportionately allocate resources across the state to Black folks. So the very first step is to have this be a mechanism to coordinate our black communities across the state. And we don't only want to focus, Tony, on what's not working for us, because we know in some of these communities, they have been able to find solutions. We need to invest in scaling those solutions across our state and even the region. So the first step is the practice of cooperation. Some of us are doing it already. Others are not, but we have a strong desire to, and we will bring tools to that to help support people in doing that. Secondly, economic security is that tide that will raise all boats in those pillars for black Washingtonians. We will focus on stabilizing people, 
financially and improving their chances for economic mobility. And secondly, COVID. We've got to look at the health of Black Washingtonians, right? We look at the stats. Angela has the figures. She's, she's the numbers guru. But the lifespan in Washington state is 80 years. But for a Black Washingtonian, it's 76. And 15 years leading up to our death, we lose our quality of life. COVID is running rampant in our communities. And so economic security, healthcare, but also cooperation. If you're asking me to do the top three, because we're saying like it's the top 15, yeah. but the top three are those. And I think the other piece that we've talked a lot about is um, healing, you know, reconciliation. You know, part of that cooperation is going to require healing. You know, we weren't, you know, brought into this country uh, to be a collective. We were brought here and we were divided. And so part of that cooperation is how do we heal among, you know, ourselves so that we can do that, that cooperation piece. And so we've talked a lot about that, but, you know, Andrew's right. Like when you, I'm, I was like, I'm glad she answered the question first. Cause I'm like, they're all, <laughs> I want to start with all of them at the same time. Like, let's go. Um, and so that's something that we're continuing to talk about, you know, how they prioritize and how we, how it evolves, the prioritization evolves. So uh, on Street Beat, we have open, honest, frank conversation. And, uh, and so what I'm hearing, cooperation, uh, economics, and health. So w when you say cooperation, what do you, let, let's start with this, what, what, what do you consider to be infrastructurally uh, systems that are in place right now for you to begin this point of cooperation with? Who are you? Who needs to cooperate? What institutions need to cooperate? What does this look like? That's a big picture thing that you're talking about there. Uh, and in particular, if you're talking about communities where, again, we're isolated to begin with. People don't even live in the same city where their church home is. Um, again, people uh, can't afford to live in certain areas. Depending, Then you have rural communities. So I'm I'm going to dig in for some details here because it sounds good. But, you know, at the same time, people are suffering. And when something like this happens, they want to know, how is this going to benefit me? So when you say cooperation, between who? Uh, are, are there institutions in place that you think that you need to initially contact to get on board with this to create allies? Well, now, Tony, you're asking us to get into a place where we feel it's community voice that needs to answer that. Part of... The prescription for this fund is we want community to say who, what, where, and when. But the paradigm I can speak to, which is we are a Black community divided, right? We like to other each other for being different in our approaches to the work. We're all doing parts of the work, and we need to honor that. And some of us, approach the work in a very confrontational way, which we need. Others doing it, doing it, are doing it in a collaborative way, which we need. And we need to understand that we can't make those approaches wrong. They're both right. We just need to know when to use them and to coordinate well, like they did in the 60s. The 60s, the movement wasn't perfect, but they were much better aligned, right? Our Black Panthers on the streets worked with our Black churches who worked with our institutions like the urban leagues and the NAACPs who worked with our elected officials. And they had their tensions inside, but they learned to cooperate to make those measures that passed during the movement pass. And we've seen relatively little change in the decades since 1960s until now. And so we need to get back to coordination. So that's the paradigm and the framework we'll lay out but in terms of what organizations and how and whom and which gospel, mm -hmm. that's for community to tell us that, Tony. Well, I think those are some of the things that people are looking for now when they're looking towards leadership. Uh, and again, just having open, honest, frank conversation back then, uh, at that time period you're talking about, there were a number of a lot of uh, a number of organizations to point to. Uh, most of them uh, were faith-based organizations. Do you see that? Uh, or do you see the role or do you have a role where faith-based organizations will be part uh, of what you're doing here with the Black Future Co-op Fund? 
Yeah, that's what drives me every day. So I'll be clear about that first and foremost. Um, they've been the cornerstone for a lot of our, our Black communities for decades. And so there definitely is a role. There's also a role for the NAACP. There's a role for the Urban League. Um, there's, a, there's a role for our, our youngest students who've come out and been protesting and leading protests you know, during this time. Um, there's a role for people who love policy. There's a role for Black Greeks. There is a role for youth groups. There is a role for anybody who wants a role. I'm somebody who does not believe in this whole stay in your lane. Mm-hmm. It's a super highway. Just put your blinker on and let me know you're coming. And, 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 and we can coordinate this. And so I think that that's the piece where, you know, when we talk about we need a paradigm shift, it, you know, I, I want us to move away from from scarcity mentality. I want us to move away um, from I own this lane. And so don't you dare come in it and really say, like, we all come with specialties and superpowers and let's get out there. Like, I couldn't go out to protest as much as I wanted to because I had pneumonia in April and May. But I was like, hey, we got to get out there. You know, they need to hear our voice. But here's how I can protest. I can protest by meeting with these groups. I can protest by creating this fund. I can protest by saying, where's the black agenda? You know, Tony, I couldn't find it. When, 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 when George Floyd's murder hit, I was reaching out to leaders and saying, okay, do, do you lead the black agenda? Who leads the black agenda? We need one. We need to come together as a people. Like we're all devastated. We're all feeling that trauma yet again. And yet we're not, you know, like, where is our focus area? And so, um, you know, that's the part that's important, not like, I'm not going to knock you for the way you did did your work to have our voice heard in this moment. It's just like, let's all come together and figure out it's many tools in the toolbox to build this infrastructure that we deserve and we need and that our future deserves and needs. And so that's the piece where I, I have gone to meetings and said, hey, why are you not using me? I sit in at the board table. I've been a vice president at, at a university. I've had multiple vice presidencies. Why are you not using me and my voice and my ability to influence? You know, you know, I, you know, we label each other. Let's get away from labeling each other. You know, you know, oh, she's a sellout because she did this. No, that's just my way of navigating the world to get where our people need to get. You know, I'm going to respect your way of navigating. I'd like you to respect mine and let's come together because I bet we have the same goal. And those are the conversations, you know, they're not all going to be kumbaya conversations of here's this great fun and let's bring it together. They're going to be hard conversations we're having across the state because we're marching into communities who haven't necessarily decided what their agenda is either as a community. So it's this sounds great and we're excited, but I will tell you already, Tony, we're exhausted and we rest and we do things, but we're not going to give up because we want to be good ancestors. That's the thing I'm holding on to. Am I being a good ancestor? If I come in in this way in this meeting, if I make this decision, am I being a good ancestor? When I'm gone here, what have I done that actually helped the babies that look like me? You're listening to Street Beat. It is me, your host, Tony B, uh, talking uh, again, the Black Futures Co-op Fund uh, with two of the architects here, uh, Andrea Capane and Angela Jones. Uh, Again, this thing kicked off with two and a half million dollars uh, in the pot. Now, that is a lot of money, but again, it's not a lot of money. But when you hear about something like this getting started, a lot of times in the black community, uh, it's, 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 <laughs> it's on nickel and dime hustle money. You know, do we have enough money to get together, um, you know, and, 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 and get a place to meet and, and, buy, and buy coffee? Uh, so, uh, again, with the goal of getting this up to $25 million. Uh, We talked, if you missed a little bit earlier, about how to possibly make this sustainable. I think that I asked the question about if there were any plans for any other streams of income uh, for this. I'm not quite sure that I got an answer. Maybe that's something that you you have or you don't have. Uh, But it leads me into the next point of this, um, which, again, we could even talk more. Cooperation is easier said than done, especially in a fractured community. Uh, And that's a uh, it's a wonderful idea and concept, um, and we'll see how it goes in, into into practice. Uh, but the second part of that was economics. So again, across the board, uh, I just mentioned a few areas, you know, and you can put health, even though that's a third one, in that economic area. Because if you don't have health insurance, if you can't go to work, uh, but you have to continue to put yourself on the front line, 
that causes problems. And then I mentioned child care. Uh, and then, uh, uh, again, uh, a lot of the folks who are essential workers are people who are now deemed essential workers, but they're underpaid frontline people. And a lot of those people are, are people of color uh, and black. So if that second area that you're talking about, uh, which is economic, some folks may that even starts with education. So when you're saying you want to impact economically, uh, does that mean helping small business? And I know I'm trying to get in the weeds here a little bit, but I want to make sure I ask you all the questions. Does that is 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 that what solidifying home ownership and and places to live and places to be in a community is is that what that looks like? When you say economics, can you make that just a little bit more clear of what that might look like? Yeah. So we we're looking at the entire continuum of economic security. We're looking at the 43 percent of black Washingtonians that are reliant on social services to make ends meet. Right. We're looking at the people who need food assistance, like you said, child care. They need their rent paid. I mean, just right now, just right now, point in time data, 4%, 4% of whites in Washington state, 4% are rent and mortgage secure. 30% of blacks in Washington state are not. So when we say economic security, it's really about immediate support to meet those basic needs and so organizations who provide those services okay i want to make sure what you said here you said four percent are but i think you meant are not if i'm not sorry four percent are not four percent of whites are not rent and mortgage secure Mm -hmm. and 30 percent of blacks are not that's a huge chasm Mm -hmm. so when we think about that and we think about our reliance on basic safety net services, we understand where the most need is right now. And as you said, 25 million isn't a lot. And so we have to invest it in the highest and best needs in our community. And again, this is all for community voices to support, but we have the data that shows we need to support people to stay housed. We're overrepresented in homelessness. We need to support people in their basic needs so they're fed, they're grossly food insecure. And we're not talking just like food that you can get anywhere. We're talking healthy food, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of us Americans are not malnourished. We're undernourished. And that includes black folks, which then leads into our health, like you said. So it's all connected. But our point is we're starting from that basic needs and then moving up the chain. And so you mentioned home ownership and owning a business. Those are all levers of economic security and economic mobility. And we wanna support organizations that are supporting individuals in our community to do that. And again, without getting in the weeds, that is how we're thinking about this. The highest and best use of these limited resources is to go where people need them most right now, but then helping to create pathways for economic mobility, which includes home ownership. And yes, it includes business starting a business, having your business survive COVID, and having your business thrive. Uh, And and Angela, I'll I'll let you follow up on this again. You know how we get down. We have open, honest, frank conversation. So at at, at this point, correct me if I'm wrong, if there is an urgent need, if, if you, if, if, if your child is not learning because your child doesn't have water and, and electricity, so they can't do the homework and go to school, uh, again, does that mean that it turns into the oppression Olympics where someone who I just described, uh, maybe that that's looking at you right now going, that's the pathway that I want. I've worked hard in school. I want to go to college. I don't have the income, but man, could I sure use a, a scholarship. And that's just as important to me. Uh, and I don't think that is just as important uh, to our community. It's a different level. Maybe it's not, again, marching and doing some other things, but it's a way that I can prepare myself to be this type of leader. And I know these are tough decisions to make. Um, so taking a situation at what I said and listening to what you just said, I, I know that you have to kind of weigh up what you have to do, but how would you look at 
uh, again, funding those types of things. And because folks who are listening today, the, when they hear there's money out there, one of the things, how is this going to spend? Who's going to get the money? Is it going to get the same old folks who always get money? Is this money going to be dispersed in a different way, as you mentioned before? Um, so it's a big question. And so I, what I think that I heard was that, you know, sometimes what people see is putting their finger in the dike, stopping a problem, but then a, a, another hole is going to pop up right away. A, am, I, am I wrong or is it just the need is so great that that's how you have to approach it right now? And I think it has to be short term, long term. It's got to be both of what you just said. And the way my brain works is I look at the entire system and I look at what the continuum looks like. If we were to have a, a well child, you have to look at them holistically from the moment they're born all the way through to them being meaningfully employed. So all the way from you know early learning through K-12, we can't just be done when they hit high school. What's the career path that we need our babies to be on? And that's you know one of the things I love. And so the great thing about this group is we have varying areas of expertise. And so connecting with Andrea, because her team is able to help, and especially even the Urban League too, but Bird Bar play in, Place in the Urban League know where some of those resources are to connect folks in that immediate need. And one of the things that, that my team loves doing is what, how do we look at this across the entire continuum to say, these are where the gaps are. This is where we're dropping kids in the system. And so one of the things we don't talk about much when you hear the fund, people hear money. But what they also need to understand is we're going to be providing technical assistance. We're not just going to hand out money and walk away. We're going to be like, OK, we're investing in you. And now here's how we're going to support you, whether it's through career pathways or, oh, you have a small business. Let us help you help connect you with maybe it's a we're going to invest in you in the beginning, but you might need a micro loan to buy A, B, C or D. We've got people willing to invest in the black community um, or, oh, you need to write a business plan here. We're going to help you. So we're going to be providing that that guidance throughout that entire continuum because what's happening is they're ignoring our kids the system wasn't ever built for us so our our, our babies are not thriving in that system um you mentioned um you know areas of revenue like what how are we going to continue to feed that fund you know that's something that we have to delve into deeper but the way my brain works um is you know, we've got, you know, the philanthropy side. So the private donors or foundations or corporations, whoever's willing to give, that's one side. But the state needs to come through. The state of Washington needs to come through in the systems they currently have and provide the type of funding that meets the agenda, we say, as, as, a, as a people that is important to the Black community. We have never gone to the governor and said, this is what we need for the Black community. Why not? Why not now? Let's do it. And they fund they fund people, you know, interest areas all the time. They need to fund this one. And we and we have the people out there who work policy, who look like us, who can help us figure out what that looks like. We don't have as many of us sitting on the floor of the Washington State Legislature. We can work on that. But we have people sitting on that floor who know the ins and outs and know what the backroom conversations look like. And so that's another way that we work too, sitting at those tables is, I'm going to have a backroom conversation with you, Superintendent Reichel. I'm going to have a conversation with you, Office of Financial Management, to talk about my people and what we need. So you won't see that in the fund information that often, but that's what I do on a daily basis. And I don't separate Angela Jones, who's a mom, from Washington STEM CEO, from you know Black Feature Co-op Fund founder. It's all a part of me. And so you know we're, we're moving in multiple ways to say this is how we're going to sustain this fund. There are so many questions I want to ask you, and I appreciate what you are doing and the answers that you are giving me. So I, I might have to rush you on these next two, and I got about 10 more. And then some folks have also wanted to talk. I, di I hadn't, didn't even get out, give out the number, which is 206-290-9685, because I know some people had questions themselves they wanted to ask at 206-290-9685, and I'm almost out of time here. And so, again, these may seem like very fundamental questions, um, uh, but again, uh, those are the questions that folks need to answer. The first one is going to be, how can other black people who say, I like this, I dig this, help you out? We have a, we have a link actually, and, and we'd have to, to send it to, I don't know if there's a way to share it because we're trying to collect, um, build a database of people interested so we can start communicating to people because we want to set up Zoom calls. So we, we can have conversations to hear, 
you know, with all the public health issues right now, we can't get in a room with, you know, you know, 50 people, 60 people. So we want to start um, collecting information. And also we want to be able to push out updates. We have a responsibility to all of you, right? You have really good questions and we should be able to answer those questions. And so we want to be able to start pushing out regular updates to say, here's where we're at. Here's where the fund's at. You know, this is where we're at in the planning process and continue to get feedback. So I don't know how to do it, but we have a link that we could share at some point, Tony, with with your listeners um, because we need to collect um, that information. Is, it, is, there, is there an easy way right now for people, because we're almost out of time, to say, I like this, I want to help. Maybe I want to donate money. Maybe I want to provide, I want to help. How can I, what can I do to help? What What, what should oh, I do? If Thank you for that. If folks want to donate, they can go to allinwa, A-L-L-I-N-W-A dot org, and look for Black Future Co-op Fund and donate directly through there. Or they can go to the Seattle Foundation's website and donate there. If they would like to, as Angela said, collaborate on building the list and resources and getting the community engagement together, they are welcome to contact each of our individual organizations closest to them. They can go to birdbarplace.org, that's B-Y-R-D-B-A-R-R-P-L-A-C-E.org and contact me. Um, They can call 206-812-4932 and get me directly and we will get this coalition going. Okay, another another quick question here because we're, and, and this is again one of those questions that for some folks it's been hard to answer, and I'm talking politicians even, but it's this: Why should black people trust you in this effort? You got to earn that. They're working to earn it. That's why we want to be transparent. Get on the list so we can share with you. Can't say why they should. Now we've put it out there. And we're 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 hoping and we're hoping that our track record speaks to it, but we know we got to earn it too. Yeah, I mean, we, as I mentioned earlier when we began this conversation, Tony, that there is this energy and this different listening that's happening right now, not just from white dominant communities, but also our black communities, wanting to deeply listen to how we can do things differently to truly make change. So I believe that this unique moment is actually on our side. And I know trust is hard and it comes in varying degrees and we will do our part and be responsible for creating mechanisms for that trust. But I think people are clamoring right now to do things differently. And so there is a willingness to come together and work on behalf of us for the black community. And, and you know, I, I, I have to ask you certain questions. Otherwise, I'm not doing my due diligence. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, but I do want to stop and take some time to say this because I think it's important. So I'm, I'm off the political correct chart here for a minute. I just want to say uh, that as a black man, I am just so proud and amazed at you as black women for stepping up in this role. I know what it took for you to be little black girls and grow up uh, with the barriers that were put in front of you and then to move into, uh, uh, again, the corporate world and the barriers that were in front of you. Uh, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just crushing on y'all right now. That's, that's just awesome. Now. Back to the show. I thank, wanna, you, Tony. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Thank you. We appreciate that. We don't get enough of that. So thank you. Make me cry, Tony. Yes. Um, this is uh, uh, this is going to be a lot of work. We talked about some big ideas. It, what happens when the rubber meets the road? So I got about thirty seconds here. Uh, if one of you would like to, get, and, and remember, you have a resource in Rainier Avenue Radio. We're, we're here to get the word out about this, to make, uh, to let people know about it, to share what your vision is. Uh, and so know that you've got a resource for here to do that. But I've got about 30 seconds left if you want to say something to the community on behalf of the Black Future Co-op Fund. That this really truly is different. This is us shifting the table to allow those unlikely voices in our Black community to have a voice and how we create solutions and a very different future, a positive future for black folks. This is really going to be a bottoms up approach. We are not going to the run of the mill approach. We want to hear from community. This is about community for our 261,000 black Washingtonians. We'll we'll have to do this again where I just take phone calls because I told folks, uh, hey, I'm going to take phone calls because they had a lot of questions and there was just a lot to talk about. And uh, and I appreciate your honesty uh, and your authenticity in answering these questions. So we'll just have to do this again sometime in the not too distant future. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. That And thank you again. We're talking about the uh, Black Futures Co-op Fund. Um, 
derive from yourself what you think that that title means, my guest joining me, Andrea Capane uh, from Bird Bar, and then Angela Jones from Washington STEM, Michelle Merriweather uh, from Urban League of Seattle, and Tawina Noble from uh, Tacoma Urban League are also part of the four uh, uh, um, who are the architects of this. That's it. That's all the time that I have. We will do this again. Uh, don't worry, we'll make this happen again. Uh, but until then, remember, it's Tony B., your host of Street Beat, saying whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you are probably right. I'm out. Peace. You're listening to RainierAvenueRadio.world. Check us out on social media.